Welcome to Decision Analyst Insider Series webinar on the future of shopper research. My name is Christy Allen and I am the Marketing Director at Decision Analyst and the moderator today. Before I introduce our presenters, I have a few notes for everyone. In the handout section, there are some relevant white papers and case studies available for everyone to download. Also, please feel free to ask questions by typing in the chat box. We will attempt to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone will respond to your question within a day or two. Today's presenters are Jerry W. Thomas, President and CEO of Decision Analyst. Jerry has served as a research and analytic consultant to many major companies over the years, helping them with their marketing strategy, new products creation, and shopper, shopping research. And Mike Humphrey, Vice President from Decision Analyst, is co-presenting. Mike has over 20 years experience in research, including management of quantitative and qualitative research across an array of categories and research techniques, focusing on volumetric forecasting and product line optimization. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Jerry. Thank you very much for attending today's uh, webinar on shopping research. Uh, before we get started, uh, I would like to just touch on a few definitions because these might be becoming blurred because of changes in the environment. Uh, the term self-service, uh, retail stores, when we use that term, we're referring to the fact that the customer can see the product on the shelf, can touch it, can put those products in a basket or cart and take them and check out. So that's what we mean by self-service retail stores. Um, a, a more recent development has been the self-checkout retail store. Of course, they're already self-service stores for the most part, but in addition to that, they're self-checkout. That is, there's some type of an electronic checkout that the shopper does herself. And then when we use the term online sales, we don't care whether that product was delivered through a retail store or delivered directly to one's home. If the purchase decision and the order was placed online, then we're classifying that as an online sale. A little history of retailing uh, to set the stage. During the second, uh, from about 1850 to 1900, there were a number of developments. Um, the, the beginnings of food processing and food canning developed. Uh, and along with that came standardized products produced in manufacture, manufacturing facilities with standardized packaging of some type. At the same time, companies began to develop brands and branding to differentiate those mass-produced products. So this was all going on from 1850 to 1900 in the U.S. Self-service retail stores began to evolve in the 1900 to 1920 uh, era. And it wasn't something that magically happened one time. It was a gradual evolution, no doubt. Uh, Piggly Wiggly supermarkets are often cited as the first company but at my advanced age, I don't believe any of those uh, claims anymore. I'm sure there was a broad, um, gradual movement towards self-service. But, but just think of it as something that began during the 1900-1920 era. And self-service retailing continued to grow during the 30s and, and the 40s, uh, during the Great Depression and World War II. But it really took off and really expanded rapidly at the end of World War II as the consumer economy came back and rationing was ended. The 1950s and the 1960s were really the golden age of shopping research and retail experimentation. Uh, when I fa first came into the marketing research industry in the mid-1960s, uh, a long time ago, 
Um, it, it's amazing, but there were a number of marketing research companies that specialized in in-store testing or retail experimentation and retail testing. Those companies have long since gone out of business. So there was tremendous amount of experimentation and research conducted in stores related to the shopping experience. And then of course the next big major uh, shift in uh, retailing occurred in the late 1990s with the emergence of online shopping. So our perspective will be mostly brand centric rather than retailer centric. That is, we could do a presentation on shopping research purely from the perspective of the retailer or purely from the perspective of the brand. So we're going to be biased toward the brand, but we will bring in retailer and retailing issues from time to time. So in a broad sense, if you think about the marketing of a brand, it's all of these things on the screen from targeting and messaging and packaging and promotion and distribution. Uh, those, are the, those are the issues that we're going to touch on today with a little mix of retail issues involved. So we at Decision Analyst employ a very broad definition of shopper insights or shopping research. Um, because so many problems can't be solved if you have a narrow perspective on what shopping research includes. So in our broad view, in our definition, shopping research includes geographical analysis, it includes retail and retailing analyses, website and app analyses that are a part of the purchase process, the category and, and sales analysis, category analysis, the brand itself and all the variables involved in marketing a brand, packaging, display and planograms, and of course pricing and promotion. So we'll touch on all of those subjects. Geographic analysis, there's a geographic dimension to virtually every marketing problem. And when you think about marketing a given brand, or even if you're thinking about from a retail perspective, geography is an incredibly an important variable. You know, it, it begins with what's the market potential by different types of households, and what are the optimal markets or targets for a brand? And what's the trade area around given stores? And what's the optimal site for retailers or the optimal store for a given site or for a given brand? So there are a lot of interacting, inter interactive issues here. And a big issue that is almost never included in geographic analysis that we think should be included is the interactions between the density of retail stores and advertising budgets or advertising efficiency. If you have high density in of retail stores in a given geographic area, you can have dominant advertising so, and the more advertising you have, the denser you can pack the stores in the given geographic area. So this is a really interesting um, angle or dimension to geographic analysis that we rarely think about. And then from the retailer perspective, um, there are a lot of issues that I, we think, think of fall within the shopping research uh, arena. So what's the optimal number of retail units in a given geographic area? This is a huge question with huge implications. And, and there are methods and techniques that can be used to answer that question. A related question, but kind of asking the question backwards, is if you have a site 
that you think is relatively good, then the question becomes what's the ideal store design for that given location? Very often we assume the store is fixed and then we're looking for sites to place that unit. But you could go at it from the other direction is what's the best unit for each site? So these are the kinds of issues that we address in retailer or retailing analyses. Um, you know, involving things like what's the shopping and traffic patterns within the store and what's the linkage between online marketing and purchases versus brick and mortar uh, distribution. So this is a growing issue. How do you optimize how do you optimize the marketing given that we now have two, in some ways, competing distribution systems? Um, an example of, of how this retail analysis can, can intersect with the brand analyses, we once had a, a brand that came to us and they were within distribution in a major retail chain and their turnover rate, their SK, SKU turnover rate, was so low that they were about to be kicked out of this major food retailer. So we did some geographical analyses and target market analyses and plotted that against all of the stores in this retail chain, chain using GIS uh, techniques. And what we discovered is that about 20% of this chain's stores were located in geographic areas where this particular product would do well. So then they were able to go back to the retailer and say, we don't want to be in all of your stores because our average turnover rate is too low. We would like to be in these 20% of your stores at these addresses and once they did that they were they had high turnover rate in those stores and they were able to maintain distribution so they could then take that model and apply to other retailers and build effective distribution for their brand so the next level is category analysis and Again, you can look at categories from the perspective of the retailer where you're trying to optimize the number and type of categories within the store. So that's one type of category analysis. But our focus is again from the brand perspective and that is what is the optimal way to market and organize the category within a given chain of stores. So, you know, the, all of the variables about what are the characteristics of the product category and how do people shop that category and what's the usage cycle look like and, and is it a product that people tend to be extremely loyal to or are they brand switching all the time? Because all of these variables affect how you would do category analyses and how you would try to optimize category analyses. Yeah, and Jerry, a great example or a great tool we can use with category analysis, of course, is brand equity research and modeling. Uh, it's really a tool to make uh, category analysis much more uh, powerful and actionable. Uh, for instance, we've done a lot of brand equity and brand loyalty modeling in the home services category to better understand a brand's value, uh, consumer loyalty to brands, what importance they place on that, likelihood to churn or switch providers. Uh, another tool in category analysis, of course, is just traditional segmentation research, which can be very uh, powerful and important when analyzing a category, both in targeting key segments and also understand what's driving shopping behaviors, both among uh, the key target segments, uh, sub-segments, uh, competitive shoppers. Uh, key driver analysis is also a tool that's been used for, of course, many years in quantitative research that uh, is useful in category category analysis. Uh, we find that key driver analysis is, is much more powerful if it's designed as a standalone study rather than an add-on for a segmentation study or a bigger project. 
the goals of key driver really need to be clear and uh, it, it just comes out a lot cleaner and more actionable when done as a standalone um, research initiative. And of course, uh, choice modeling um, and, and combined with absolutely three D three D animation um, and shelf set uh, simulation is a really powerful category uh, analysis set of tools as well. Brand analysis, um, as we said, the you know all of these variables that affect the brand are important because they. They have effects in the store, uh, they have effects at retail, they have effects in the category. And these are just basic fundamental things that every company should know about its brands, like what is your brand awareness? Um, what's the image of your brand compared to all the other brands in the category? And what's the optimal position for your brand? And how's your advertising awareness compared to competitive advertising awareness? It's all of these basic marketing questions that well-managed companies should know or have answers to for their brand. Uh, you know, how does the product itself compare to competitive products? These are questions, by the way, that all consumer goods companies 30 years ago knew the answers to. These same questions in many companies today do not know the answers to because research budgets have been cut so much since the start of the Great, uh, the great Recession. But 30, 40 years ago, Virtually every major company could answer all of these marketing questions because they did the basic research to answer all of these kinds of questions. But all of these brand analytic questions are important in trying to optimize the shopping experience itself. Yeah, and a great way to, to really dive deep on brand analysis is just doing some real thorough and rigorous uh, ethnography, for example, shop alongs. Uh, we've had experience with shop alongs with professional tradesmen, uh, following them along in the shopping experience for tools and power tools at different locations. And this way we can see the real interaction between <clears throat> brand and, and other aspects and also how brand and specific retailers are uh, affecting each other and on the brand impressions. Uh, brand tracking, of course, is a necessary tool, we feel, quantitative brand tracking to help monitor on an ongoing basis, the brand's health as well as the competitors. Um, it's important uh, in brand tracking to include some questions around where where the consumers shop, why they're shopping there. Um, that really helps us, uh, you know, track trends with uh, brands and brand perception. Of course, brand equity modeling can be a part of any uh, brand tracking exercise as well. And just. Um Tracking the brand metrics can often be combined with advertising tracking. There are many companies that do two separate tracking studies, but it's generally if you have a really, you know, a good questionnaire designer can combine those two and save a lot of money. The bigger sin is all the companies that don't track their brand or don't track the consumer. So they're just running their business blind. Package analysis is kind of the next level uh, of uh, analysis involving shopping research and ranges everything from what's the optimal type of package for a category and the optimal sizes and shapes as well as package design which involves visibility and the attention value and brand name registration and what images and messages are being paid, uh, you know, paid, uh, being conveyed, sorry, by the package design itself. And then all these elements have to be integrated and harmonized uh, so that they all come together on the shelf. Yeah, and of course, one of the big challenges nowadays is uh, creating packaging that works both in an online and in-store environment. Uh, for a, you know, a large number of categories, that's, that's true these days. You know, this is another great fit for, from a research, research perspective for qualitative research and ethnography and shop-alongs both doing them virtually in, a, in an online environment and also a retail or in-store uh, setting. Um, quantitative online package testing has really also uh, progressed a long, long way here in the past few years with 
virtual tools that we have and, and 3D packaging where survey respondents can pick packages off the shelf and rotate them and read different aspects. Um, instead of the uh, traditional static or flat concept uh, tests that we've done in the past, uh, many years ago. Um, this also is a great way to simulate the experience of an online shopping uh, occasion. So we've uh, done some research where, where we'll take people through like a telecom uh, purchase decision process and really try to simulate that, that experience for them in an online environment and get it as real, as li uh, real life as we can. The next level of analysis is the display itself and involves questions such as what's optimal shelf placement and what's the optimal number of facings and what, you know, should you be next to brand A or next to brand B and do you have the same planogram all year long or can you improve your brand's performance by changing its display configuration by year, assuming you get retailers to cooperate with you, which is a, a typically a, a, a big issue. Um, another uh, question that related to display is you, you have the shelf and you have online, and then you have end aisle or, or non-shelf displays within stores. And I think Mike has an interesting uh, story about the relationship between in aisle displays and, and the shelf itself. Yeah, so we did some research with a national dollar store chain uh, testing different end cap combinations, specifically in the snack foods category. Uh, it, it was tested in a virtual online shopping exercise, so we made it as real life as we could with an online tool. Um, this was really designed to help maximize the impact of the end caps and determine what combination of products there would uh, result in the most uh, consumer purchase frequency, number of products they purchase, that sort of thing. Uh, we found, interestingly enough, from the study that just one, one product, one SKU, uh, placed appropriately in the end cap had a significant impact on the purchase of other snacks as well as beverages, so it was really uh, insightful from that perspective and really powerful in the, in the research conclusions. Pricing is one of the most difficult uh, subjects uh, to do marketing research on because everyone has an incentive to lie and distort the, the truth. But for a given brand and product category, we really need to understand the role of pricing. What what are optimal pricing differentials? That is, at what you know, if you're raising your price, at what point does it begin to trigger brand switching? Uh, another big issue in in pricing are, are anchor points or reference points. Uh, sometimes people will just not buy the most expensive product but sometimes if you put a really expensive price on one product it'll make a a lower level product look much more attractive that's what I mean by anchors or reference points so all of these factors are involved in pricing research it's really important to understand these pricing differentials and price elasticity by category uh, it's important to understand if they're pricing thresholds. Virtually everyone in marketing believes in pricing thresholds. That's why you see so many two ninety seven and a dollar ninety nine and four sixty seven type pricing. You see very rarely do you see whole dollar pricing. Well, does that really make a difference or not? Well, it might in some categories, but not in. Other. So pricing is a really important area and, and this requires some real sophistication in research to get at the pricing issues. Yeah, we've done a lot of work with pricing optimization, uh, specifically in the telecom industry and, and other industries too. Uh, you know, discrete choice exercises are, and designs are a great tool to get at price optimization and developing uh, price curves and testing those thresholds. Uh, price floors and price caps that Jerry referred to. 
Uh, and really, the, the discrete choice approach, of course, gives us the advantage of uh, forcing the respondent, uh, the survey participant, to make trade-offs as they're uh, going through a, a, a survey exercise rather than just rating things as uh, too high or too low on a certain scale. Of course, one of the great deliverables of a discrete choice study is a simulation tool, which allows for the testing of different price points and their impact on demand for a certain product combination or a combination uh, of a shelf set. Um, that allows us to optimize price for different products and services, also bundles, whether it's in uh, telecom or other industries. Um, survey respondents see the exercises they would when they're shopping online, more than just rating things kind of on a monadic level or individually. So pricing analyses also come into play a lot in, in volumetric forecasting, that is uh, forecasting the sales of new products. So we, we can apply some of those techniques also in, in pricing analyses. Promotion analysis uh, is another major component of shopping research. And in a perfect world, the promotions would reinforce the brand's positioning. So if you're, for example, Bennigan's was an Irish restaurant uh, before it uh, uh, went out of business, but they did a wonderful job of using their promotions to reinforce the brand's strategic positioning. So they really played to their Irish positioning and Irish heritage and on St. Patrick's Day they would put up you know sell green beer and have tents and Irish bands and everyone came and paid a premium price to participate in their promotions which also reinforced their positioning. So that's an example of how promotions work in a world of perfect uh, worlds. Uh, an idea that's very important when you think about promotion is reach versus frequency. If you are trying to introduce a new product and your goal is to get new triers, then the purpose of your promotion is reach. You're trying to bring in as many new people as possible. If you have an established brand and you're trying to boost frequency of purchase, you're trying to get people to buy one more hamburger a month, then it's a, you're on a frequency strategy and the promotions are trying to generate frequency. So it's really important to think about your promotions and whether your goal is reach or your goal is frequency because that leads you to different types of uh, promotions. And a, a practical app research application for promotional analysis is another discrete choice approach that we often use, max diff uh, technique. Uh, again, it's forcing trade-offs with these promotions and, and forcing a, a ranking of the promotions rather than on a, uh, a rating scale. And it really allows us to optimize the mix of promotions and messages uh, using uh, turf techniques like, like Jerry referred to. You know, for instance, the, the top three ranked promotions or messages may not be the ones that we want to use if they're all reaching the same audience. So we want to get a unique combination of promotions and messages that reach the, the widest variety of our, uh, widest uh, group of our target segment. Uh, of course, good qualitative research is always recommended when developing promotions. Uh, we always recommend some uh, qualitative research to help refine uh, messages and promotions, also whittle down. Uh, the potential promotions. Um, this can also, of course, be a part of a larger discrete choice study and, and tested in more of a uh, real life manner, if you will, um, which is a really great rigorous way to, to test promotions and bundles uh, as part of a larger choice design. The volumetric implications of promotion, as I mentioned, we do a lot of volumetric forecasting, that is forecasting the sales volume for new products. So those, those volumetric forecasting techniques can also be applied to promotion analysis. And you can begin to see what's your return on investment for different types of promotions. There are a number of research methods uh, used in 
uh, shopping research. Um, we'll go through those just quickly uh, to touch base. Uh, the first I mentioned earlier are the, the geographical dimension. We typically use G various GIS platforms or geographical information systems. And you can think of a geographical information system as layers of data atop each other so that you can see in a three-dimensional space how all of these variables interact and relate to each other. So. GIS type analyses or you know we use for trade area analyses and modeling and prediction and how to predict the trade area for a given store which is important in site selection modeling and site optimization uh, trying to map market potential for a given brand or a given retailer so all of the geograph geographic information can be organized in a concise way and, and presented in an understandable way to, to marketing executives. Qualitative research may be the single most important type of research uh, for, for shopping insights and shopping research. Uh, we, we love depth interviews because we can talk to someone about a particular shopping experience. We can have them take pictures. We can even put you know, glasses on them so we can see what they're seeing in the store. And then we can interview them in depth about what they were looking at and why they were looking at it. So qualitative research, uh, we do a lot of shop-along type uh, depth. You think of those as kind of a quasi-depth interview while people are shopping. And, and with uh, the mobile, you know, with the mobile telephone and the camera, we can take pictures now in retail stores or take pictures of websites that we never could have we never had visibility in before so so there's a lot of potential to use the camera within um, uh, smartphones. Also, camera technologies improve so much now that it's possible to use cameras. We put cameras in automobiles, for example, to monitor husband and wife while they're shopping various types of uh, retail, uh, especially uh, fast food. So qualitative research uh, allows us to really dig deeper, to use projective techniques, and so forth. Uh, so conjoint and choice modeling, we've talked about these techniques today uh, for a couple of applications and, and shopper research. And of course, conjoint and choice modeling is all about optimizing product features and service bundles, packaging, shelf displays, pricing, and so on. And again, the real advantage of this approach is the, the, the trade-offs that you force consumers to do, and it, you know, that really helps us optimize uh, price and other uh, aspects of a of a, a product and, and package and services. It's really an efficient way to, to accomplish a lot in one project or, or study. Uh, of course, we always recommend, as Jerry was just talking about, we always recommend doing some, some good, rigorous, qualitative research before we enter into a conjoint or choice, choice modeling quantitative survey to help refine the pricing, the product combinations, and the attributes and levels that we're going to be testing. When uh, testing concepts, uh, the choice modeling approach uh, can be applied. You can test like a thousand concepts mm -hmm. all at one time with choice modeling. So you can get the cost per concept down to fifty dollars a concept. Less, it's, right. it's a rarely used but but a powerful approach. Um, and. You know, survey research is still an extremely valuable tool here in, in shopper insights and shopper research. Uh, we think it's um, sometimes get, gets put on the back burner sometimes with the trends and, and new techniques we see in marketing research these days and, and shopper insights. But, you know, good old-fashioned survey research is still a, an extremely valuable tool to understand more about shoppers in a particular category. Uh, these are just some examples here of different uh, survey tools to help better understand shoppers. Um, it's important to select the one or two 
approaches or designs here that best answers the objectives. And just, I, I can't, I can't overstate the importance of basic types of research that companies need to be doing on an ongoing basic, uh, basis. And it's kind of like doing your homework when you're in college. You know, that homework really saves you in the end. And, and uh, awareness trial and usage studies used to be done for every brand, for virtually every company. They're rarely done now, so so many companies don't really know what's going on in the environment where they're trying to market their products. So the last uh, uh, topic, and we've, we've touched upon this, but there are a lot of advanced analytics techniques that can be used uh, as a part of shopping research, depending on what you're, you're trying to accomplish. We've talked a lot about choice modeling, but the whole family of multiple regression techniques and discriminant analyses and their data mining techniques and routines and even artificial intelligence and machine learning can be uh, included. Uh, predictive analytics, certainly in the whole site selection work and trying to optimize the trade area for a given store. A lot of application of predictive analytics and so forth. So uh, advanced analytics is really important because often we, we have really large data sets uh, that we can work on and apply some of these really powerful modeling techniques. So we've had a question or two come in. Mike, do you have those yeah, we've, there? Yeah, we've got one question here, Jerry, and I think it's uh, best for, um, for you to, to answer here. But how do you deal with some of the trends these days with the overlap of consumer insights and, and shopper insights departments? It's kind of an interesting uh, history. Uh, if you go back 50 years, marketing research departments in major corporations uh, covered, um, they, in, they did a lot of consumer research and they did all of the shopping research and all of the syndicated research and all, most of the data analytics. So all of the marketing research functions were closely integrated. Um, Today, many companies, you know, have shopper insights and then they have consumer insights departments. Um, and where it's possible, the, the, the goal here is very close integration of these two um, departments or these two functions. Uh, they should report to the same boss in a world of perfect worlds. They should be copying each other on everything. And many of the projects that both groups undertake should be joint projects, should be closely integrated because they're both learning things in every project that would help the other group or the other team. Yeah, I think we, you know, we've seen this movement toward calling departments uh, consumer insights versus marketing research. And uh, you, can, you can argue one way or the other on whether that's a good title for the department or not. But uh, really trying to, um, you know, address concerns of different organizations in the, in the company is important. Uh, making sure everyone understands the objectives of research that's to take place, um, you know, kind of getting the group together uh, to, to talk through the best way to approach uh, business objectives and challenges for the business, I, I think, is a, a really good plan when you're executing a research program. Uh, we have one more question here, Jerry. Uh, what do you see as the future of, of uh, online shopping and how will that impact shopper or different techniques in, on, in uh, shopper research? That's a, that's a really profound uh, and interesting question. Uh, and I've thought a lot about this question. Um, right now, online sales uh, in the consumer world account for about somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of total retail sales. Uh, and if you, and so you think, so you try to think about extremes. So if we go a hundred years into the future, will all retailing be online? 
Mm, I doubt that. Uh, it's, uh, you know, because if all retailing were online, you could attack it with retail stores very effectively because stores have some advantages over online and vice versa. So the most interesting question is where, where is the balancing point? Where is the tipping point? Um, because right now there's so much money being invested in the online distribution system. There's so much advertising support being put behind it. There's so much investment money in the online that it's inflating the power or the appeal of online versus traditional retail stores, which are spending and investing at much lower levels. So where it's all going to shake out is a very complicated issue. Um, but I think we're going to have many retailers uh, in business 100 years from now doing very well. Thank you very much. Um, but I would say that, you know, if you, and it part it depends on time too. I, I think once we get up around the 20, 30% level of online sales, I think it's going to be very difficult to go beyond that. Um, over a long period of time, we might significantly, uh, but I would bet you the rate of growth of online sales is even beginning to slow. That is the in instantaneous rate is beginning to diminish even now at the 11, 12% level. Yeah, and I think a lot of that will depend on the, the rate of these mergers and acquisitions like we see Amazon acquiring Whole Foods in the past few years and, and, and business mergers like that and how it will be interesting to see how that affects the uh, online versus uh, traditional retail world. Um, I think that's all the questions we had for today. So uh, Christy, I'll turn it back over to you now. Thank you everyone for attending today's Insider Series webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to email Jerry or Mike. Our next Insider Series webinar will be on attribution modeling and multi-channel marketing. It will be on November 14th. Thank you again for attending and have a wonderful rest of the day.